you know, this word has come to my head, medical aesthetics. So I went to obviously the team and said, you know, when the, the boss is inventing brand names, it's kind of dangerous. So uh, if you have a better idea, I'm totally open, but please, you know, I'm only going to give you about four or six weeks because we, you know, got to keep moving here. Yes. And of course, they, nobody came up with anything much better. And so that was the beginning of medical aesthetics. And of course, you know, a year later, where the world's press is writing about uh, um, medical aesthetics or la medicina aesthetica or la medicine esthetique, mm. you know, then you know you've arrived because right. so you're starting to coin a genre and you can start really building from that if you like, small foundation stone upwards. And that is why he's called the father of medical aesthetics. Hello, and welcome back to the Technology of Beauty, where I have the opportunity to interview the movers and the shakers of the beauty business. And folks, today is no exception. Today, probably the largest most influential mover and shaker of the beauty business is sitting right here to my left, Mr. David Pyatt. He's come up here and I've been asking him to come up for a couple of years. I cannot tell you how excited I am to have Mr. Pyatt here on the Technology of Beauty. Thank you, David. Great. Thanks for the invitation, Grant. It's taken a while, but as they always say, save uh, the best. It doesn't come that easy, right? Okay. I agree. I agree. Uh, so, thank you. Before we get into the aesthetics and the technology of beauty, I'd like you to share with us, where were you born? And tell us a little bit about your education and your early uh, early years, if you would. Well, given that I know that you have Scottish-American heritage, I'm going to be super careful um, because as a shocking fact, I was actually born in London, of all places. Okay. And uh, that's because my parents lived in India. And so I actually spent the first seven years of my life on a sugar plantation in India. And uh, that kind of probably gave me the incentive and the ability to learn languages because as a young child, I was bilingual in Marathi, which is the language of Mumbai. Uh -huh. um, so of course I wasn't exactly the slum dog. I was probably more like the, the millionaire, uh -huh. if you remember yes, that movie. Of course I do. And then of course, given the way I speak, you know, after we went back to Europe, I grew up in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And what part of Scotland did you grow up in? I'm actually from the West Coast, from Glasgow, so I'm one of the few people that wouldn't require simultaneous translation uh, <laughs> on this uh, uh, podcast. Yes. Um, and your mother lived in? She was actually English. Uh -huh. She was a very interesting person because uh, uh, maybe in terms of the way I like to know what was going on, you know, almost military intelligence. Uh, my mother actually decoded the last message from the last British agent when she worked for what the British called the Foreign Office, which would be, you know, the State Department in sure. this country. And she worked sure. in Bletchley Park, Churchill's decoding station. So that is wonderful. It's a kind of a fun little fact. Absolutely. The last message she decoded. That's right. And later on, luckily, the guy made it out and she met him in Bletchley Park. What a wonderful story. Okay. So then, where'd you go to school? How about college or university, I guess? Yeah, sure. I was about to uh, do a, a, a English versus American uh, language check. Uh, so I was a bit of a collector. So uh, I went to Edinburgh University mm -hmm. um, and I studied languages, but I kind of dropped that pretty quickly and um, really liked uh, politics and economics and law. And uh, during that period, and I also have a diploma in European law from the University of Amsterdam. And in between, I also studied law in Germany, which was very interesting. Can you imagine going into a German law lecture, having to take notes? I was, Do you also speak German? Yeah, I'm absolutely bilingual. Okay. Yeah. Well, trilingual then. Yeah, I, I speak, uh, as one of my best friends uh, growing up said, you know, if you speak English, Scottish, and rubbish, <laughs> you're off to a fast start. <laughs> That's good. So you went to German law school? Uh, actually, a university where I studied German constitutional law, which was a real mind teaser. I bet. And uh, it was 
really fun. It was like learning the history of um, the Constitution, you know, because obviously Germany has gone through, you know, lots of momentous changes, you know, in the last, call it 150 years. Mm -hmm. And and the role of the United States and the UK were really influential, how today's modern Germany came about. So it was very intellectually interesting. And uh, and then I worked as a banker for a little bit till I discovered I didn't like that. Uh -huh. And then I went to business school, which, uh, you know, I decided that uh, it was time to get serious and actually learn something that could be applied. Where'd you go to business school? And how old were you when you went to business school? Yeah, uh, so I went to London Business School. Um, I like to, uh, to toot the horn a little bit because uh, unlike the rest of your guests, I actually have nothing to sell today, which is kind of fun. <laughs> well, they don't say, all have something to sell. Yeah, yeah. But you're right. You're right. But uh, indeed, you're I not could, here to sell me anything. Sure. I, I could say pretty much what I like. I used to do that anyway. And now I'm probably even worse. But uh, I'm actually the deputy chairman of the London Business School on the governing body. Presently. Presently. And, uh, you know, when you're a deputy, there's always a certain danger around the corner, right? Mm-hmm. And, but anyway, that's where I went to business school. And I have to be very proud that, you know, whatever ranking you read every year, you know, the full-time MBA programs always in the top six. I mean, if it's ever six, we're all wearing black ties, you know. But uh -huh. We like to compete with uh, these other little places, you know, called Harvard, Stanford, Harvard, and Wharton, and Stanford, little tiny yeah, yeah. Universities. It's, it's good to have a competition. Absolutely. Love competition. So, before law, uh, before business school, you did law school in two countries, right? Yeah, it was, uh, Scotland and, and the Netherlands. Right. And then, of course, the... So, was law school at the University of Edinburgh also? Yeah, I never, though, planned to be a lawyer. It was more intellectual pursuits. But uh, I, for people who used to work for me at Tallergan, I used to joke that I know enough about the law to keep out of trouble most of the time. <laughs> and uh, I was quite infamous for asking very awkward questions on documents. But that's just because, you know, when you're trained to read things very carefully, you know, you do it out of quick curiosity. Yeah. Sure. Because there's any, you know, devilment of catching somebody out. And we've had a number of guests who are uh, high-level executives who went to law school and have that basis. So they're very analytical and they're very precise in reading the contracts and so forth. Correct. So then there was business school. And? And you were about how old when you finished business so, school? So I was 28, 28. When, when I left business school. And when did you come to the States? Uh, that was, in a way, much later. But oh, uh, sure. Um, so... I can sort of say uh, as, a, as a joke that I've lived in the United States three times. So the very first time I had a summer job in, of all places, Akron, Ohio. <laughs> so from my social security card, I can prove that I'm really a Buckeye, which is another probably thing you wouldn't have known about. Not hardly. I don't think anybody knows. Does anybody know David's a Buckeye? There you go. Oh, my goodness. So I had a wonderful time there. Um, went back to Europe and immediately studied after that in Germany. I had the equivalent of a Fulbright from the German government. And then because after business school, I worked for what today is called Novartis uh -huh, um, sure. for 17 years. Um, and I'd already, I was very much in the European region of Novartis. Uh -huh. And then I was transferred to Asia. And it wasn't until there was kind of a, Actually, looking back, it was funny, you know, a big mess. And I had a reputation of cleaning up big messes. Okay. And so I was then brought back for my second tour of living in the United States. I like to joke this was my post-Latino phase oh. because I was transferred from Barcelona to Minneapolis. Oh, my God. And uh, maybe that was the first frozen face that I ever experienced. Yes. Well, wait a minute. You were in Barcelona? I was in Barcelona, and I, they gave Do you speak Spanish also? Por supuesto, senor. Oh, wow. Okay. So, and the reason was, if you work for a Swiss company, uh, you know, if you don't speak, uh, you know, at least language. three languages. <laughs> so, I mean, how on earth could you even be an executive, right? Right. So how long were you in Barcelona? So, uh, that was uh, almost four years, and then um, Minnesota, and then because that all kind of worked out pretty well, I got pulled back to Switzerland to be the division president. So I was then 
I was just 41. And, you know, I was running actually a pretty big business. It was well over $3 billion mm-hmm. in revenue, which, you know, long, long ago, it was probably in today's money, probably more like 10. Mm-hmm. And so seemed like a big business. And, sure. And then because I got bis- disenchanted about the strategic importance of that business within Novartis, it was time to move on. And luckily that's when... Uh, this little company called Allergan popped up. And so that was my third time of coming back to the United States. And that was back from Switzerland then to Irvine? Straight, straight to Irvine. I like to say it was the best airline ticket I ever bought. A one a one way <laughs> Zurich to LAX. And was I happy to be back in the United States? And that was your third stint That's back right. to Orange County, where I'm from. Yeah. So uh, it was great because I, of course, you know, even a knucklehead like me realizes on the third time, don't leave this time. I'm here for good. <laughs> and he's there still. He's still down there in Orange County. Okay, so you arrive and you're employed. What was your title at Allegan, your first title? CEO? Yeah, yeah. So one of my sons always is very curious about, you know, how careers developed and hierarchy. And I like to say, if you get a choice, it's always good to start as the CEO. <laughs> Indeed. You, you, you don't really have anywhere else left to go, right? That's right. Uh, now, remind me that year. So that was literally uh, the 3rd of January, 1998, is when I arrived and I set up my okay. office in Irvine. And then I stayed for 17 years in total. Right, and we'll get to that. But at that time you arrived, <clears throat> and Allergan's primary focus was ocular, is that correct? Ophthalmology. Yeah, and ophthalmology. interestingly, when one goes back through, I mean, obviously statistics move around at the margin, but actually throughout the whole Allergan period, the old Allergan pre uh, the acquisition by activists, um, was always plus minus 50%. Uh, ophthalmology is and was always huge. Mm-hmm. And of course, we had it even more fun when we get to uh, some of the stuff that we share together. It's funny, in my fellowship, I, I have the opportunity to uh, to have the young fellows for the last 24 years. And uh, <clears throat> I've had about 40 of them come through out of residency. Whenever I say allergen, they think of, of course, Botox, and then they think of breast implants and all. I say, you know, I actually remember allergen before either existed. Uh, and I talked to him about Inamed, and I talked to him about McGann and so forth. But, but let's go back. What I want to talk to you a little bit about Botox. Do you remember the first interactions you may have had with the Carruthers? Oh, yes, been on the course. program. Yes. Can you take us back and paint a picture? Uh, do you recall the first time someone talked to you about uh, a toxin in the face to stop wrinkles and look pretty? Yeah. Do you remember? How did yep. that go? The beginning. The very beginning. Um, when obviously, you know, I was considering, am I interested in this company, Allergan? And for the other side, you know, the board, mm-hmm. it was a big deal because when I finally ended up getting the job, it was already year 49 of the company yeah. and I was only the third CEO. So extremely unusual mm-hmm. in business anywhere. Yes. And of course, as I did all my reading and even more importantly, once I showed up, I was very puzzled by this Botox thing. Like, it seemed rather interesting, and it was still very small. It was in its entirety $100 million in sales. And, of course, this was off-label in terms of the cosmetic use. But that was still for blepharosplasm, correct? And strabismus. Had had Jean started the... the, Yep. Had she started, she injected herself. Uh, She was on the program and and her assistant. So she'd already done that, that, but Botox Cosmetica did not exist. It was all off-label, correct? That's right. So as far as I could sort of guess, listening to people and piecing it together, I think when I started Botox Cosmetic, as it then later became, was about 20 million worldwide. And of course, you know, the first thing you I, I always like to do is, you know, ask the whoever you think is really smart around the company, like where are the opportunities? And many people said, you know, there's something big here. And uh, the prior regime was very nervous about this. Some thought that it was flippant, it wasn't serious. And I'm very pragmatic. I said, you know, show me all the data on safety and uh, 
duration, side effects, all that stuff. And of course, it now seems ridiculous even answering this question, right? Um, it seemed all very, very good to me. Of course, now millions and millions and millions of vials later, what I thought so, I know so now. But ben, back then, when they first were trying to explain to you, we're going to stick a needle in someone's face, and that's going to hurt. And then we're going to put a toxin in that we were taught to avoid rusty needles and, we, and where we'd get lockjaw and all that sort of connotation growing up with tetanus shots and such. Did it give you any pause at all that you were going to sell it for the pursuit of beauty? No, not at all. I, I think because I then spoke to people like the Carruthers and others who were very early adopters. Sure. Um, you know, I can think of Rick Glogau up in San Francisco, obviously Arnie Klein, mm -hmm. um, you know, Pat Bexler in New York. Mm -hmm. um, there were lots of good, really, really good uh, dermatologists and plastic surgeons who basically, you know, were super enthusiastic. And, of course, I did ask as a final question always, like, where are the problems that you could see arising? So that after all that, it became so obvious. It was like, okay, we got to go to the FDA. And they knew that the sales were really accelerating off-label. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they too had a real positive motivation of getting it on-label because, of course, they knew until that moment, we couldn't train anybody. I mean, I'd right. be committing terrible, terrible sins. So I still vividly remember, you know, that the people in the trial used to complain bitterly uh, when they came to the end of six months. And it was like, I don't get the product anymore. That was a very good sign. And of course, the, the real wonderful day was the best tax day I'll ever, ever remember. April 15, 2001 was... Uh, D-Day for Botox in the United States. For the approval for That's cosmetic. cosmetic. Now, prior to the approval for cosmetic, was the primary indication blepharospasm? And strabismus. And strabism. uh, It was also hemifacial spasm. Okay. Those were the three that were on label. And, of course, cervical dystonia was bit coming along at that stage as well. You know, you mentioned Arnie Klein, and it's a name I haven't heard for a while. As you know, he's in this community, and I was a young plastic surgeon. And he taught me how to inject Botox That's for great. cosmetic yeah. purposes. The great and he, circle. And he gave some uh, some courses also in Marina Del Rey. And he was so generous and gracious, he had me to his office. And I can remember thinking, this is great. This is fantastic. And I was a plastic surgeon. I already had a med spa. And I thought, this is fantastic. People can look terrific with injecting this, but it wasn't it wasn't on label when I learned, as you mentioned. So again, April 15th, 2001, that is the key. That's the key date. And of course, then we could really get going. And of course, because I've marketed lots of consumer products as well. Right. I think, I mean, like everything, you know, Rome wasn't built by one Caesar. And of course, it always, and in a great company, it's all about a great team. You know, right. many, many people contributed. And of course, many of those people in the great circle of life who've now sat at this table yes. as your guests, you know, yes. who've moved on to do other great things. But I think what was really fun was um, I realized this sort of very interesting name, Botox, and whether I liked it or not, that was the name. And of course, everybody, especially early days, kind of react to it like, is that good or is that bad? Uh -huh. But it certainly gets your attention. Yes. And, and years later, of course, I love to joke, uh, because I'm Scottish, I was too mean to spend the money on market research, but I knew that Botox had become the most famous pharmaceutical brand in the United States, which of course was, sorry Pfizer, sorry about Viagra, <laughs> we're number one now. And But it was great to go through the gears. And uh, I think another really key moment was uh, the realization how there would be a huge future in dermal fillers. And it was uh, an interesting headstand for me because we just divested our ophthalmic medical device business, okay. which was intraocular lenses in mm -hmm. its kind of core, as well as uh, lens care solutions. So these were, if you like, the juice to wash your and clean your contact lenses. So yeah. we'd separated that out. And here we were contemplating getting back into the medical device business, because that's the way it's regulated. Okay. Uh, and the entry point was the acquisition of Juvederm. 
in France. And so, so tell me about that. Tell me about the acquisition of Jupiter, because I don't know, I don't know that history. Well, it was a really uh, wonderful um, beginning of it. And there's often, you know, accidents which are very positive, but you have to listen and watch very carefully. And so fortunately, um, hyaluronic acid, uh, I think many people know, you know, started its major use in cataract surgery sure. and also in, in joints, particularly knees. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's like Genzyme in Boston was kind of the progenitor of HA in the knees. So, of course, we could read up on this. But very fortunately, uh, one of the types of um, viscoelastic, to use the technical term, one needs for cataract surgery, we had difficulty making. And so we found this wonderful company in the French Alps that made it. And so later on, I hear this company is also doing Juvederm. I go, Juvederm, okay. And then I start asking people in Europe about dermal fillers, and it was really obvious. This was the perfect companion product for Botox, because today it sounds obvious, right? You'd mm -hmm. say that, I mean, we'll make it simple. I know there's so many experts listening. That time you could say, Botox is there and fillers is here. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we know it's a lot more kind of fun and more complicated right. than that today. But um, so I knew the guy. So uh, You knew the guy who was making the, Juvederm? Was making, yeah, Juvederm. <laughs> and of course, because I speak French too, he liked that. And so we made him an offer he couldn't refuse. And we basically bought the Juvederm, the company behind it, Corneal. Mm -hmm. Corneal sounds like yes. ophthalmology, which it was. Mm -hmm. And ironically spun out the, the few pieces of ophthalmic business they had because that wasn't what we wanted. And uh, one of my jokes at the time, I think they sold, it was probably 10 million euros worth of Juvederm. And uh, basically, uh, Monsieur, vous parlez français? You do not speak uh, French? I do not sell you my Juvederm, huh? So most of their sales were in France, northern Italy, northern Spain, Switzerland and Belgium. Mm -hmm. and of course, we, we hitched that wonderful product onto our huge American truck called Botox. Did you license it or buy it? We bought it. We, we bought the company okay. in France. And then later on, it was one of the major reasons we bought Inamed in Santa Barbara. Right. Because they had the license for Juvederm for North America. And then we could complete the circle. And uh, so we literally have taken... Um, Juvederm, I was just looking at the AbV numbers the other day. I think it looks like they will sell about one and a half billion dollars of the Juvederm collection mm -hmm. as it is known today. So it was a nice little journey, 20 million or 10 million euros to 1.5 billion. And uh, my French friend, uh, he received 120 million euros, but I didn't feel so bad because he bought a football club, you know, which is kind of rich Europeans like doing that. Absolutely. And that was a lot more money back then. Yeah, yeah. And of course, I mean soccer, right? Not yes, football. of course. So even though you purchased Juvederm, yep. Inamed still had the license for America. They had. Now, I thought you bought Inamed for the implants. No, Once it, was again, it was both. Both. Yeah. But no. primarily the Juvederm? Yeah. The, the license? Well, it was really both, both. because, uh, of course, you know, given the I'll call it the balance of the business. Mm -hmm. um, and this was before the reintroduction of silicone. So of course That's I right. had to really, 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 we had to do our, our homework because I remember going to my head of R&D, Scott Whitcup and others on the team and saying, look, if there's any risk of serious harm with silicone breast implants, I'm the first person that wants to know. Mm -hmm. Because of course we could all remember and read about the litigation you know, prior to the moratorium. Sure. And it was so crystal clear. So we went, it's go time, and we're now in the breast implant business as well. And so that bridges to another great thing, if I may. Please. So I'm sitting in my office thinking, this is getting more complicated, right? We've got uh, the Juvederm, the dermal fillers. We have botulinum toxin. Now we have implants. And we also had some small, you know, consumer-oriented dermatology products as well. Uh -huh. So I said, we, we need something snappy and easy to talk about. So I'm looking at the ceiling pretty much. And because I'm a marketing guy, I said, you know, this word has come to my head, medical aesthetics. 
So I went to obviously the team and said, you know, when the the boss is inventing brand names, it's kind of dangerous. So uh, if you have a better idea, I'm totally open, but please, you know, I'm only going to give you about four or six weeks because we, you know, got to keep moving here. Yes. And of course, they, nobody came up with anything much better. And so that was the beginning of medical aesthetics. And of course, you know, a year later, where the world's press is writing about uh, um, medical aesthetics or la medicina aesthetica or la medicine esthetique, mm. you know, then you know you've arrived because right. you're starting to coin a genre and you can start really building from that, if you like, small foundation stone upwards. And that is why he's called the father of medical aesthetics. In some ways, yeah. But you clearly are. You but of course, are. it was a huge team effort. That was oh, I recognize that, and everyone does, but there has to be someone at the top. And uh, so there you were. And I want to go back. You mentioned you're a marketer. You still have to convince the consumer to stick that needle in her face and have the practitioner pump in some toxin. I'm sure that was a heavy lift from a marketing point of view and an advertising point of view. Can you give me any feel for either you know, what what happened, the amount of money you spent on it versus your revenue? I can I would imagine you had to spend a lot of money to get over fear of pain, fear of harm, fear of uh, uh, all sorts of adverse reactions, even though you knew and the Carruthers knew and the, those that you mentioned earlier knew it was effective and safe. Yep. But that's a big lift. So give us some insight to how you got Botox in, I mean, it is the most, yeah, mainstream. mainstream. Yeah. I'm sure there's a story or stories there. Yeah, well, I think there's, I, because I've been involved in lots of different product market categories, Yes, you, you always know there's hurdles and there's opportunities. And I think, as I kind of made a comment earlier, you know, sometimes opportunity can be smiling right at you, but you have to be able to see it. Yes. And so talking to, I'll call it the real movers and shakers, your, your colleagues, mm -hmm. whether they were plastics or derms, or they could be, you know, even in those early days, people who had moved in, mm -hmm. you know, from being a GP or whatever. Right. But we knew who the really good people were. And of course, I was really checking in with them. Like you get people coming back, right, for years. Uh -huh. And of course, everybody was reassuring me, absolutely. I mean, and you could see it from the way, because we knew where we shipped the product because it was being- Yeah, you saw consumption. Right? Sure. So, you know, those early days, we said, okay, would you be willing to help us? Because you've clearly mastered the technique of how, you know, the, the result versus, you know, the, t the pain with a very small P mm -hmm. uh, can be balanced and, you know, what tricks and what methodologies do you use? And some people had slightly different procedures, but there were and dilutions and technique, right? And so you start getting to, you know, where's the common denominator that really works? And then after that, for me, it was right, okay, we have got to supercharge this, you know, where it's almost like a, you know, a pyramid, you know, I don't want to get into Tupperware, but you could sort of think about where you have, you know, super experts that are willing to then train other physicians in their region mm -hmm. to become competent. And then of course they move up and become more competent. And then you say, are you willing to help? And of course, then you can start really getting the, the capacity, pyramid really starts, right? really get the capacity going. And in those early days, of course, we use PR. I can think of, uh, you know, Virginia Madsen as in Sideways mm -hmm. and Santa Barbara mm -hmm. and others, because we needed some ability to consumerize it. I used that word earlier, you know, that uh, you got to keep things simple. You got to make it attractive to people uh, versus, you know, my God, I'm the botulinum toxin thing. Let's, you have to be straightforward. That's what it's called. Right. It'd be unethical to hide that. But let's get to the positives of what is the benefit. Because I'm sure, I mean, I quite like driving fast cars, but I actually don't care too much how they actually work. Uh -huh. You know, the famous what's under the hood. Yes. And and then I think in parallel to that, we realized there's a huge opportunity for direct-to-consumer advertising. And, you know, we got beyond the Virginia Madsen, who was a great spokesperson and a face in the early days to, 
you know, getting into the mainstream of the soccer mom would probably be the best yep. analogy in this country, at least. And of course, we could see this phenomenon happening not just in this country, which is enormously important, but worldwide. And uh, I could see each of these streams uh, occurring. And I'd say during that time, the one country that really, really surprised me was the one I'm from. I would have never have guessed that the UK medical aesthetics market would become the biggest in Europe. I thought this is, you know, the land of crooked teeth because uh, <laughs> you have to pay for the derma, the dentist yourself sure. right? in, in many places in Europe, especially the UK. But of course, looking back, I was always curious, like I would have thought the French would be the superheroes mm -hmm. and they are huge as well, clearly. And you know, places in Scandinavia, I got right, you know, very conservative. Uh, but the real thing that was going on in the UK was the British love to see what's going on in America. And they could see Botox and Juvederm taking off in America. So they had to have it as well. And of course, despite all the jokes about, uh, you know, two great countries divided by a common language, <laughs> they can understand it and mm -hmm. they watch American media. And of course, we fomented that. Yes. How about Asia early on? Uh, that one, particularly Korea, I'm sure you know. And yeah, I know about Korea now, about. but early on, did they embrace it? Yeah, very quickly. I mean, per capita, it's still the number one con it's, country, even more than America. It is huge. Yes. I mean, in those, in those early days, I used to talk to my colleagues. I said, Seoul is the, the Paris of uh, Asia. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I'd worked in Asia. So, uh, you know, you've got to be very careful about, you know, ever confusing one country with the other. Oh. But it would be the same of saying like, well, Italy and Spain are the same, right? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, we could say there's many common points, but they have their subtle differences. Absolutely. And they're very proud of them. Too. Of course. So Korea and, and Japan followed? Japan was much later. Much a later. very complicated market to get regulatory approval. And uh, their FDA, sort of? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. And where did China figure in? Probably that very little of that later. Time. Yeah, at that time, later. very small. Whereas, of course, in the period since I left Allergan, if you aren't big in China, then you should probably... Uh, <laughs> uh, sure, yeah, you you should probably hire a new executive. Yes. Uh, one other question is that re relates to the globe. What about Australia? That one came very quickly as well. And I think it was also the, the English language connection that uh, Australians in the same way look to the mother country because I'd say of all the parts of the British Commonwealth, uh, Australia still is probably the closest. Uh, and the Aussies and the Yanks are very close. Too. And I was about to say, yeah. and of course, if you live in particularly a place like Sydney or Brisbane was where it started, they always look to California and say, you know, what's the different might between uh, Sydney and uh, LI? Or it's pretty similar. Right? Yes, right. Gold Coast and all the rest. Yeah, yeah, so that was an easy one, you know. Okay. So you're promoting Botox and Juvederm. You push that Juvederm brand. You had just a few and then you just, you kept expanding the fillers. Yeah, and I think one of the, that was the one of, I have many funny memories of sort of aha moments and, I always loved, uh, above all, visiting customers and going to, you know, big conventions. Mm -hmm. And uh, that time, I remember going to IMCAS, which, you know, occurs always in January in Paris. Right, of course. And, uh, you know, I'm meeting with the, the top French customers and asking them, you know, what they thought. We just literally announced the acquisition of Corneal and Juvederm. Uh -huh. And uh, I said, you know, what's the next opportunity? So this person says, Monsieur, it is Voluma. And I go, and who owns that? And he goes, vous, Monsieur, you? Yes. I go, oh, really cool. So tell me about this. And so I get down to the factory in the French Alps and start probing. And I come back to Irvine a week later and I go, we have an absolute jewel hiding in our own safe. And I started really checking and of course, a couple of years later, we had regulatory approval. So it was a Frenchman in Paris at MCAS who told you, the CEO, that you own Voluma? Yes. I mean, we should have known, or maybe my That's crazy. 
But and Bloom was such a change with the Z, Z with Prime and the duration and all the other indications yeah, that were so different than the typical Jupiter. So isn't this fun? Because it's I'm sure somebody on the due diligence team clearly knew, but for whatever reason decided this little thing in the fridge <laughs> wasn't that important. Vu. <laughs> Well, so it, was a, it was a wonderful one. So that was another one where, you know, and of course Europe was quicker because of the lower regulatory barrier. And of course that first impression was correct. And uh, we did the same thing. You know, we go from one really knowledgeable injector customer to the next and say, you know, beyond the excellence of the product, of course we had to teach people how to inject it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, stiffness and softness, all that stuff. And your you depth get, of injection. You better get oh, it right. Absolutely. So you you're know, not putting the Luma in the lips. <laughs> so this is where, again, you can sort of, I always look at market creation as sort of a series of concentric rings uh -huh. where you just make it bigger and bigger and bigger. And, of course, our job sitting in the company is to try and make it as simple as possible for the customer and the happier the patient is the end result that we all share in common. Absolutely. When did Skin Medica come on the scene with you? That would have been probably another three or four years later where that was clearly the beginning of, uh, you know, how do we have a broader and broader product range mm -hmm. that fits together? And we learned early, you know, which sales types, you know, as you would have remember from those days, as a very important customer. So for our um, audience, uh, Grant was, during my time, the most important customer on the West Coast. So you're very kind. And I know don't just mean in terms of pleasant to deal with, but just how many, you know, invoices, size of invoice came through order entry mm -hmm. in Allergan, Irvine. But of course, when you um, go through the gears, um, with your customers. It's how do you just make it simpler and better and better and better. And um, we clearly knew with Skin Medica we needed a different type of salesperson because, of course, somebody as proficient as yourself, you can't be spending your valuable time educating the patient, the consumer, mm -hmm. uh, about um, Skin Medica type products. TNS. That's okay. right, TNS. A novel. A very novel a product. Really important product. But of course, what was great was it needed the imprimatur of mm -hmm. the doctor. But then, if you like, the dispensing, the follow-up, the hand-holding sometimes. Different skill set through entirely. Through the front office staff. And of course, that's a sort of another wonderful thing, I think, about this whole concentric rings of creating a gigantic market. Because if you think back to the numbers I've been giving you, it was a tiny little market mm -hmm. in let's even call it 2000. It was probably a couple of hundred million dollars worldwide of everything you could throw in. E the Botox and the Juvederm? Yeah, it was a couple hundred million. Whereas uh, I saw some numbers, because I did go and check my file and a couple of things on the internet. I think the current estimate is about 13 billion as a market mm -hmm. time. Yeah. So I mean, that you'd say, what are we talking about here? This is like Model T to today you know, getting into traffic congestion. And we're only talking 20 years. It's a very short time of period. Very short. short time. And so it's, each of these things were so interesting to fine tune them. And of course, always the end result was a happy patient or a happy consumer. Mm -hmm. And of course, many happy doctors on the way, right? Right. Because beyond your professional pleasure of, um, you know, delivering beautiful results, of course, it's also created some beautiful practices mm -hmm. all over the world. And as you acquired these different products, uh, it gave us more tools with which to help the patient on their journey, the customer, if you will, on their journey towards uh, looking their very best. And we learned, we all learned that when you look good and you look feel good about how you look, you feel good about life. That's right. And a lot of people still discount that, uh, but it's very clear that when we're feeling, and when we look better, we feel better. And as you layer it on, you know, uh, people confuse fillers with Botox, for instance. And I say, well, one turns off the wrinkles, and we know it's the muscles, and the one smooths the skin. And I'm yeah. thinking of fillers. And I know it's far more complex yeah, of course, than that. Of course. Uh, but you've seen throughout your career, people yeah. confuse the two. They yeah. say, I had Botox in my lip. 
And, yeah, yeah. and you know it's darn good and well, they're talking about yeah. uh, the fillers, right? Yeah. And then when you layered on the skincare, and he, before that, most skincare was uh, just a lubricant uh, and so forth, but you finally had an active ingredient and Fritz and, and then the group down there in San Diego and TNS and you acquired it. And it gave us yet another tool with which to help the patient on their journey of looking their very best. Yep. Right. Yep. And that has continued. And think about all the companies that have followed. Yep. Uh, again, followed the consumer. It's being driven by the consumer's desire to look their best, right? That's right. They look. They want it to look youthful and happy forever. That's mm -hmm. what we're delivering, right? And, and do you remember we used to call it, uh, and some still do, uh, rejuvenation. You'll talk about rejuvenative medicine and rejuvenation. And now, as the average age of entry is going downwards, we're now calling it prejuvenation. And we talked about it today on the show with some other guests, this concept of getting in front of the wrinkles, getting in front of the brown spots, the signs of aging, getting in front of them so you retard them. Maybe you hold them at bay entirely. Yep. Um, and I think the beauty of that, when I look at where the market is today, um, you can see that younger consumers, of course, they don't even imagine what people were thinking 20 years ago with this whole, you know, toxin thing in front and center. They just see this as mainstream. Totally. And of course, they're much more willing to try new things, which is great. Equally, of course, they can be less faithful if you offer a bad experience mm -hmm. than I think any marketer or any position to that degree, you know, messes up, you know, we all pay the penalty and I don't really apologize for it, that don't do it again, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it also gets back to, you know, other subliminal things. I was actually chuckling to myself because uh, we used to talk about, you know, uh, the Allergan partner privileges. Yes. And of course, it was a frequent flyer program, ADP. really. I and and well. it wasn't just... Uh, you know, the value of what level of discount you'd get, but also, of course, just like the airlines, if you're up there, mm -hmm. you're going to get uh, a better check-in experience. You're going to get to the lounge versus sitting in row 28F. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we tried to avoid 28F, clearly, you know, treat everybody nicely, but some super nicely. And I remember uh, a, a fun time with you once where you were telling me how you were a double black diamond customer. Yes. You were super important. Uh -huh. So I used to joke internally because it was a big deal. And, you know, we had a plaque for you in the practice in Marina Del Rey. But of course, from my perspective, I could say I was selling prestige. And of course, as a Scotsman, the cost of goods of prestige is relatively low. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. It's the cost of a plaque mm -hmm. and maybe a nice letter and Maybe I should call you every day on every year on your birthday, you know, <laughs> like Jonah. And you know what you did that year that I had was double black diamond? I caught you were your set. I received two black diamond um, medal, not medal, but oh, the trophies. Yeah, black fantastic. And I put one on top of another and, and for fun taped them. And I said, I'm a double black diamond. That's great. In those days, you gave us extra points. Uh, for our breast implants also. Yeah. And so as a plastic surgeon who also had a very healthy med spa, I had a leg up on my derm colleagues because I stacked it with my breast implants, remember? Yeah, sure. And you gave us great advantages. So yeah. the plastic surgeon had a busy skincare. And remember early on, a lot of plastic surgeons did not embrace skincare. Yeah, of course. Uh, they may have done some fillers, they may have done some Botox, but even that early on, I can remember one of my professors who's now gone, but he called me up once and said, you're not a dermatologist. And he lectured me about having the skincare, the med spa. And I said, but I'm trying to optimize the looks of my facelifts. And I, that's when I started the icing on the cake, the concept of, tried, you know, I can make pee, I can do the paint, the, the, uh, body work, but I want to work on the paint job also. Yep. And that's what the skin. But I think that was also like the whole concept of, you know, where we started the conversation you know, simplistically, it was here up, right, with uh, Botox for wrinkles. But of course, where that then ended up was the total face approach where, you know, both us and our competitors, you know, have introduced more and more products that were designed just for the lips or just for the jaw. Yeah, it's comprehensive. And it's funny, when you said that early on, I had never thought of it as a sort of geographical separation vis-a-vis. -vis. I'd never thought of 
uh, toxins here and fillers here. I'd never considered it that way because I thought of it differently. The toxins for muscles or wrinkles and fillers for to fill in or to augment the facial skeleton and so forth. But when you said that, I thought, yeah, that's right. In those early days, that's how it was rolled out to us. Yeah. I remember those early days. I'm so fortunate to have lived through them. And before we get to what you're doing now, though, I want to ask you, do you remember the time we were together in Aspen at the uh, medical meeting um, cosmetic boot camp? Yeah, I remember that, too. And we had the, uh, that sp- that room with the industry and a few physicians. Yeah. And you were, I remember where you were seated and I remember where I was seated and you remember the gentleman, no, g- not a gentleman, the person whose name will not be revealed, who came and sat down next to me late, bragging that his jet was late and so forth. Do you remember that? I remember that. There are so many people who bring that up to me. It's like, how could all these people have been there when Kennedy was shot? <laughs> I, I know how many people were in that room, yeah. but s- way more people bring that up about you were there and that's before activists purchased uh allergan from you yeah that was quite quite a uh, event that i'll never forget so i i know you know what i mean okay well we could go on forever but i want to know what you're doing now you're i know you're very busy and you're not commercial right now tell me what uh what you're passionate about right now what, yeah so i'm me. pretty standard uh you know, for people who have run a company, I'm on a couple of public boards. Sure. But, uh, I very intentionally uh, am learning new businesses. So, you know, I like to always go forward, never go back to somewhere where you've been, unless it's just for a short visit like this, where it's uh-huh. pleasure, it's fun. Good. Uh, but I think more importantly, I, I spend a lot of time on not-for-profits. Um, I'm on the Caltech board these days in Pasadena. Yes. I just got elected to the executive committee. Um, I'm deputy chairman of London Business School. Right. But I'd also do a lot of eye care uh, philanthropy, uh, particularly directed at Africa. And of course, when you step back, you can say, well, you know, I've, I'm privileged because um, I understand ophthalmology very, very well. You know, I've been around it for 25 years now. Mm-hmm. I, I know the physicians that are great trainers, those that are willing to donate their time and their talent to teach colleagues in emerging markets. Mm -hmm. And of course, I know the network. And above all, I also have money that I can, uh, where I see good people with an ability to train Mm -hmm. the very few ophthalmologists that exist. In Africa? In Africa. So I'm a great believer. I used to joke at Allergan, you know, being also an eye care company, if you can't focus, that we need a long conversation about that (laughs) and and so we have like five or six projects all in east africa and the most important one is with orbis which is the charity with this iconic dc-10 it's the flying eye hospital oh it's wonderful Um, and so to keep it simple when we started we realized i mean it was even for me and i knew a lot about eye care having the shocking reality that there's 17 million people in Zambia, which is right in the center of Africa, north of Rhodesia, mm-hmm. or Zimbabwe today. Yes. And um, 28 ophthalmologists. So, of course, even if you were in a city but you were poor and you had a cataract, you would probably go blind. Mm-hmm. So we set out to say we, we wish to enable and help the government double the number of ophthalmologists in Zambia. And, of course, then I have to add well-trained mm-hmm. with the appropriate equipment and supplies. So I'm happy to say we're now at 35. Good yeah, for you. year four, and it's sort of like a curve like this. Uh-huh. So those are good ones where you can sort of say, you know, if you weren't having a good time and, you know, the, the New Year's rolls around and you can say, well, we can say definitely that every year we're saving thousands of people's sight in uh, particularly East Africa. Is it primarily by uh, using intraocular lenses? Yeah. Is that the primary yeah, approach? Really, our approach is all about how do you find really good people to train people beneath them? Right. And it's, it's just like the whole Botox. Mm-hmm. The pyramid. Around, the pyramid once again. And uh, it's really gratifying. And uh, maybe another wonderful sort of impulse I got was that I like to tease him because he's my younger brother. Um, he's an ophthalmologist. 
And so I kind of got into his business when I joined Allergan. And to his credit, he worked in the Palestinian hospital in Jerusalem for four years, where I'm also involved. Because I'm actually another cool title is I'm the hospitaller of the American Priory of the Order of St. John. And St. John is a you know knightly order that goes back to the Crusades. Yes. So uh, the, the order in Jerusalem has been providing care for almost a thousand years now and the eye hospital for 140. And so my dear brother did that and then he went to Cambodia for nine years immediately after Pol Pot. So, you know, some people talk about doing great things. Mm -hmm. Fewer people actually go do it. Right. So, uh, in a way, I'm following a little bit in his... Uh, and he's your little brother. That's my little brother. Yeah. And where is he living now? Inverness, the north of Scotland. He's now back in Scotland. Okay. So well, this is in a way saying that there is life after CEO. Yes. He can do other things. And beyond uh, philanthropy, something I personally quite enjoy is helping other people have great ideas and, you know, giving them a, if you like, a impetus to go try something new. Uh-huh. As a mentor? As a mentor. Mm -hmm. No. And is that exclusively in aesthetics or across That's aesthetics and eye care and everything? of business. And okay. it's often very, there's commonalities where you can say, I, I was talking to somebody in Europe today in the vaccine field, and of course, I wasn't going to teach this person anything. I mean, he knows probably 20,000 times more than I know about vaccines. But he was looking for new ways of how those products should be brought to market, how they should be available en masse. Look what we went through. Yes. And so I gave him some ideas, I think. He seemed super happy at the end, and that's my job, right? If, yes. You know, you're trying to help somebody find even better ways to do their business in that case. Do you have any thoughts about transcutaneous delivery of various drugs, just in general, from 40,000 feet, be it toxins or vaccines came to my mind, uh, insulin. I know Dan Brown years ago was talking about transcutaneous insulin delivery, and there's various technologies out there. Any thoughts about I think always it's, it's how do you um, deliver highly effective drugs in a shorter, less painful time. That is the common denominator. Uh-huh. I was involved in a company in Silicon Valley, which uh, actually produced uh, a fascinating little pill, which actually dissolves as you, I mean, you just swallow it. Uh -huh. And it deploys needles to develop drug straight into the stomach wall. It's amazing. And you can, I mean, when I heard about this, my mind was on fire. Wow. I mean, it's not yet FDA approved, obviously, but, uh, you know, you can imagine the ideas you can have. And, they're into using three different drugs right now, testing them, the early ones in humans. Okay. So that's just one example of how do you deliver drugs more effectively? Sure, and without needles and so forth. And we talk about third world countries. When I hear some of this, I think, well, needles are not only, well, they hurt, but there's also some risk to them. You can stick them in the wrong place or someone else can be hurt by them. There's just so many obstacles. And then infection. And infection and so forth. If we could drop Imagine third world countries, if we could drop packages out of planes to underserved communities and they rub it on their hand or what, maybe it's a, a vaccine. Could happen one day, right? Right. And then with children, or diabetes, so who, what, who wants to get a needle, much less a child who's now got type 1 diabetes and so forth? I think, oh, wow, wouldn't that be wonderful if we could deliver insulin topically? It would be unbelievable. A far more important if you ask me than delivering toxins uh, transcutaneously. Now, lately there's been a lot of talk about duration mm -hmm. and uh, duration of toxin. Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, where yeah. do you come down on that? Yeah. I mean, I was thinking, I thought you'd ask me that today as I was reflecting. Uh-huh. And what's well, a hot topic. Yeah, of course. We, we have four toxins at least already with similar uh, pharmacal connects three to four months and so forth. And now all of a sudden we have one that has 24 weeks to nine months, but let's call it 24 weeks. Yeah. How do you so, think that's going to affect the, the marketplace? Right. So I was thinking where I'll, I'll sort of do the journey back into the future. So I'll start in a different place and then I'll answer the question. Perfect. So I think, you know, it's very interesting to think back to dermal fillers. Uh, that's the, go. let's go down that path. Okay. So when we bought Inamed, 
we bought also bovine collagen, which you remember, you know, if it lasted three months, you're pretty happy. Yes. And of course, then the first generation HA fillers, probably six months would be what I have in Max. my mind. Mm -hmm. And of course, then with Vol Voluma, which was the great 18, exactly. So that was a good example of where duration is really helpful. And of course, maybe it's a bit of an unfair comparison when you think about, you know, the the volume uh -huh. and, and the duration you desire. And of course, the beauty of, we know with HA is today, it seems like, really, but we knew that we had done our emergency break, right? Mm -hmm. And the runner days. Yes. Like if you got into- That's our rescue. The rescue. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, in a way, we don't have the exact rescue with botulinum toxin. So I think you've, like everything, got to be very careful that if things get too long, there's a reason that that's been engineered that way. So it also means your ability to put the car in reverse mm -hmm. also gets much more complicated. Mm -hmm. So my sense, though, is if you think of the consumer, I think probably six months is about the max that anybody would want uh, because you don't want to look like Dr. Spock. You remember all that stuff mm -hmm. in the old days? Right, the frozen face. And the frozen face. So you've got to be careful you don't go too far. Sure. And, I mean, my own view, and, of course, even today I'm a bit prejudiced because, you know, I read every probably botulinum toxin paper for 20 years, and so you know a lot about not only your own products but your competitors. Mm -hmm. And so I think that... Um, we're in a phase where whatever the label says and whatever the different companies say, um, basically it's high dose toxin is what's happening. And it makes sense, right? If you have more dose in the same muscle or muscle group, you'd expect it to last longer, all things being equal. So I think that's the sort of phase this market's in. But I, I think it's a, I wouldn't, personally think it would be a good idea for the market or even the companies or the doctors to have this lasting, I'll exaggerate, a year. I think six months is probably somewhere in a golden, one of those golden proportions. Okay. Now I'm going to give, I agree with you. I totally agree with you. I'm going to give you a little bit of the contrarian argument and I want to hear your response. In the case of Daxify, while they have 40 units and we have 20 units of Botox, it turns out 40 units, their unit scale, is still one or 0.18 nanograms of the botulinum toxin. And 20 units of Botox is 0.18 nanograms. But what they have, as you know, is the peptide. And the peptide, which was originally invented to help facilitate the transdermal uh, uh, penetration, and that didn't work out. But they kept that peptide in there. And there's something that happens between the peptide and the toxin. It's the only toxin of the four others that have the peptide along with the toxin. And their position is, it's not dose. Their position is the dose is the same, uh, the 0.18 nanograms, if you will. And that it's actually the addition of the peptide that creates this different longevity. Any co thoughts or comments Maybe. on that? I think the next thing that I'll be wanting to see in practice is the other famous uh, question of spread or no spread. Yeah. Because, of course, we may not, you, we all remember, um, and of course, obviously, where I worked, I had to have a point of view, right? Of course. Um, you know, that, but I think it's fair to say, you know, looking back over 25 years, and now I'm comparing Botox with Dysport. Yes. That Dysport definitely spreads more than Botox. Yes. Now, in certain muscle areas, that's maybe an advantage or spread. Mm -hmm. Of course, from a allergan point of view, you'd say you want to have targeted delivery and, and control and control. And hence, I I confess to way back, you will hear a few prejudicial comments from me because you you grew up in your own school, if you like, and right? and you tout the attributes, and for sure you want the precision of where you deliver it. Although spread might be helpful in certain areas, maybe the forehead, but not certainly spreading down to the abicular or the uh, levator aponeurosis, the levator muscle, and then you get the ptosis. So it can also lead to complications, as we both know. So there's there's pros and cons, right? 
Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, it will be interesting now that the FDA has approved Daxify. It's going to be very interesting to me uh, to, f- to follow and watch the consumer journey. And it's also uh, fascinating to me that when we looked at, and this, when, when Allergan looked at how many times do people come in a year for their Botox? And as you know, the brilliant distinctions data is 1.6 to 1.8 times a year. And when we did this with HINMD, we did the same thing. And mine was 2.2. And when we instituted subscription, it went to 3.2 times a year, just with the addition of subscription, which is another interesting thing about the public, the consuming public. If they're paying a little bit every month, it's it's easier. It's easier. Yeah, and we live in that kind of economy. And so now when we talk about a six-month duration toxin, I wonder if the person will still come in approximately two times a year. That's right. 1.8. And if she or he now is therapeutic throughout the year, Versus this episodic uh, thing, and I, I, we I, lo- I love the brand, the fact you brought up something like HentMD because what it shows you is some of these very subtle offerings can really change consumer behavior. Absolutely. And of course, once you've decoded that, you can start saying, well, what else could be done that absolutely brilliantly matches that consumer desire? That's where my mind always goes. And I was fortunate enough to be working with Aubrey and Voin and one of the founders of that. And, and we tracked every one of the patients we put in and we saw the change in behavior in those that joined the club, if you will, in subscription. And we, we got up to 600 people and we tracked what happened with fillers. We had a 70% increase in cons- consumption of fillers. We, as I told you, what happened with the Botox and then the combination. It, it's a natural combination to have a, bot- a toxin and a filler. And yet, we only had around 20% of the people that did that. And when we added the subscription, subscription, it doubled just by changing the way in which the consumer paid for the product, which was incredible to me. Yeah. Uh, As you're talking about toxin, it made me think... Uh, I, I kind of committed one of my own sins that I used to, uh, shows you, you forget. Okay. Um, you know, early into the journey, I said, we got to find a better word than toxin, mm-hmm. for God's sakes. And uh, it was actually a New Zealander in Paris that poked me in the ribs over this. And he said, he goes, you got to find a better word. And he gave me a clue from my old company. And so we came up with the word neuromodulate. Neuromodulate. Because that, oh, that sounds a heck of a bit better. Right? Because I would s- pound on my staff, don't use the word toxin. No one wants a toxin. So we went to neuromodulator. But frankly, neuromodulator didn't mean much to many people. That's right. Yeah. And so they did, neuro was nerves and modulator. What are you talking about? So we're back kind of talking about toxins again. And as you mentioned, the young people now. Their parents have had Botox for 20 years, and they're now in their 20s and 30s and even young 40s, and they don't even question what we questioned 20 years ago. That's right. Uh, it's mainstream. It's on the media. It's everywhere, as you mentioned. Yep. Well, we haven't even talked about plug-in devices, right? Because <laughs> everyone knows, <laughs> anyone in this business who knows David, and everyone does, he had a, a mantra at Allergan. I'll let him refute it if he wishes, but I heard him say it in the days, and we had the opportunity to see one another in my practice, and, and I had a wonderful time. I've learned so much from David Pyatt. But he said, I don't buy anything that plugs into the wall. Now, David, did you not say that? or did? Yeah, I'm afraid I used to say it often. I was thinking, uh, you know, in my old age, maybe my views are softening, but uh, I think on a serious basis, though, the, the reason I said that was uh, way back at the beginning of Allergan yes. when I joined, um, you know, we had the FACO machines. Yes. The machines for doing cataract surgery. Mm-hmm. And of course, appropriately, if ever you had a problem with that machine, your customer really hated you. Right. And they could say, pack up your whole kit bag of stuff and get it out of here. And not only the intraocular lenses, but all the pharmaceuticals and the uh-huh. lot. Yeah. So the, if the, the the day you had a bad FACO day was a really, really miserable day for the doctor, but also for the company. Okay. And so, you know, you learn from that. And of course, you go to enormous lengths to make sure that that machine never really screws up. And it, so it'd be like running a car business. Like if you just bought Mercedes, you know, you can't have it in the shop than the regular service. Yes. Um, so I think the way I'd 
on a serious note, look at it is uh, you just have to look very carefully at the economics. And I have to confess that before I moved on, you know, we too looked very carefully at school, school sculpting. Yes. And I was happy in many ways later to see, you know, it happened. Right. But I think you have to look very carefully to make sure you understand what it takes to really deliver delight both to the physician and obviously the, the patient after that. Indeed. And does that work? Because you can get yourself really distracted into sidelines. And probably if I were there, and I'm sure it's done that way, you have a separate group of people because we don't want the mainstream mm-hmm. facial aesthetics people getting distracted with cool sculpting. And frankly, you know that better than I do. And body country in general. It's a separate vertical. It's a separate. And it's a separate sales staff. As you know, it's an entirely different person than sells capital than sells just a pure consumable. Absolutely. And I'm sure even in your practice, you had it. Absolutely. Very, as you know, I, I embraced uh, cool sculpting very early on with freeze the fat and, uh, you know, one machine, two machines, three machines, and got as high as nine machines in the Marine at one time and worked very closely with Mark. And it was very successful. And I remember when you were looking after and purchasing it and then subsequently when Brent took over and yeah. that, pr- that the sale went through. Uh, it's certainly not for everybody. I totally get it. But I want you to know, it comes up all the time. Uh, David Pye would never buy anything that plugs into the wall. Yet there are some good things that plug into the wall. Yeah, right. You know, it just wasn't wasn't on your uh, horizon. And yet yeah, you look at companies like Cyton, world class lasers, Bentleys of lasers, and they're they're just as myopic as you're saying about keeping them running at all times. They're handmade, and the, boy, they jump on any little thing. But they don't have the cross problem either. That then, so I understand why you did it. But so, there are some wonderful machines that we plug in nowadays. Yep. So I think if you were running Allergan today, I might get you to look at a few of the things <laughs> that plug in uh, and device. And there's a lot of devices now that are coming out that are single use, even. Yep. Uh, for in the beauty sector, uh, they're they're peel pack, one time use, and discard, and so forth. Yep. So they're not plug-in per se, but they're also not quite, uh, they're somewhere a hybrid between the two. Yep. Sure. Well, this has been an absolute joy. Uh, again, if you look into the future, and we've talked about the future a bunch, but if you look in your crystal ball now, if we're sitting here at this table in three years, five years, 10 years, let's say we're fortunate to be sitting here in 10 years. Yep. Oh, we're skiing together in yeah, 10 sure. years. We haven't even talked about your love of skiing, which I know about. Yeah. Um, what's the future look for, like in aesthetic medicine, the term you coined? Yeah, well, I think, you know, there's going to be continuous, just dramatic growth. And, uh, you know, when I think about those early days, the very beginning of our conversation, we said a couple hundred million world market. Uh-huh. Uh, if I just look at AbbVie's sales, which are easy number to go check, um, you know, when we handed over, it was about two billion mm-hmm. for aesthetics. Right. This year, it's going to be well over five billion. So that's pretty good. You know, in seven years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, and I think you know, as the the world ages, I think the the desire to look younger um, is only going to continue. And of course, at some point, the Millennials that we were talking about will end up being my age, God forbid, right? <laughs> and and they'll be even more, I think, keen, yes, to make sure that you know a fifty-year-old looks like a thirty-year-old and a seventy-year-old looks like a fifty-year-old. So it's going to be an incredible bright future, just from demographics and I think acceptance, and of course, the whole provider community gets better and better. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this is now. Um, if you like the best consumer experiences that could be offered around the products. Mm -hmm. And I think in terms of technology, uh, one that sort of fascinates me is, is is there going to be something post HA? If somebody were to find something that's even better performing, that would be a real game changer. And of course, toxins, neuromodulators, they could be improved, but it is a very, very long cycle. And uh, we had lots of ideas about, uh, you know, what the new super modulator would look like. And I think it's 10, 15 years of uh, very, very hard work. 
and I'm, I'd love to know nobody would dare confess to me what's going on inside the lab at Allergan or the other companies mm -hmm. so I'm always just looking for where's the next need where we believe we have a technology at our fingertips or one that you described it could be a confluence yes to put together mm -hmm. so uh, I think for everybody listening to this uh, podcast if you're in the provider community uh, keep planning to hire people and train them very well because there's a lot of demand out there that's right. It's growing exponentially, even in spite of economic downturns every now and then. It's like the lipstick effect during the Depression, right? And we saw it We came roaring back after the pandemic, and some of the cynics said, oh, it's just pent-up demand. It's warehoused, and it'll fall right off, and that's not what happened, as you know. It doesn't look like that this time. I see no indication yep. at all. What a great uh, business and genre to be in. Absolutely. Well, I love it. And that's the technology of beauty. It's a wonderful time to be in the beauty business and to be optimizing people's appearance and how they feel about themselves. Well, David, you know, I could talk to you forever, but I need to get you home. And I want to thank you so very much for being my guest Pleasure. and being our guest and sharing the stories and the history and the background. I wish you nothing but the best. And your philanthropy is... Uh, so inspirational to all of us and uh, all the th wonderful things you're doing for so many people. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. And what I tell you, the mover and shaker, number one, the man who started medical aesthetics. Thank you very much for joining us today on the Technology of Beauty, where I had the opportunity to interview the number one mover and shaker of the beauty business. Thank you, David Pyatt. See you next week.